Hello everyone, I'm George from Ireland and I'm on Sandy Cove Road uh, in Dublin and um, behind me is the house where Roger Casement was born. I'm not sure if it's the left hand one or the right hand one, maybe it was at one house at the time. Uh, so he was born here in 1864. He was a project of what we call a mixed marriage in Ireland, as in one of his parents was Protestant, the other was Church of Ireland. Now as an infant he was baptised in both churches but he was then brought up in the Church of Ireland. He didn't spend much of his childhood um, in, in Dublin. They moved to Antrim, and so he grew up there in a more Protestant milieu. He was um, from quite a middle-class family. This is a decidedly bourgeois area, Sandy Cove. So was very fortunate to be here, considering most people were very poor at the time. When he was born, there wasn't even compulsory schooling, so some children didn't go to school at all. Um, Anyway, he left school in his late teens, which was unusual back then. If you went to school at all, often left school at 12. Um, if you're a bit lucky, 14, and he was at school till he was 17, if I got that right. And then he had relatives who were um, in a ship brokerage business. He joined that. He did various um, clerical positions, worked his way up. Um, so he was uh, reasonably well off. And um, then went into his 20s, he joined um, uh, the British Diplomatic Service, because of course, with part of the United Kingdom, he was British as well as Irish. So there was absolutely no contradiction, especially in those days. Um, so uh, he was posted to the Belgian, sorry, to the Congo Free State, I should say. And so Leopold II, King of the Belgians, ruled the Congo personally. The Belgian government had no role in it. Um, so in a sense, it was an absolute monarchy. Uh, quite, in what sense it was a free state, I'm not sure. It, the, the, the government was really free from any legal constraints. So um, he formed the International Association of the Congo, the Congress of Berlin in 1885. It had been agreed that uh, um, the interior of Africa could be divvied up, and this was for Leopold II. Um, anyway, uh, so who was um, a Sax Koba Goethe as in a distant relative of, of Queen Victoria. So I don't actually ever visited the Congo actually, but he had Henry Morton Stanley, this British American um, uh, explorer, buccaneer, newsman um, as his agent. And um, so various deals were struck with uh, um, uh, indigenous uh, chieftains and it was really about extracting rubber because in the 1840s, um, pneumatic rubber had been invented Dunlop had taken it further, first of all for bicycles, various industrial uses, but then, and then in 1885, Carl Benz invented the car. Now, when he was thinking, when Leopold II was thinking about the Congo, tyres for cars and trucks were not very important, there were just so few of them. But anyway, rubber was an increasingly valuable commodity, and so was, uh, so was ivory. Um, so uh, he wanted the people of the Congo to extract these things from the jungle. The rubber actually originally came from Brazil. And the Brazil Brazilians had banned the export of rubber seeds because they had the monopoly on rubber until two British guys um, committed a crime by smuggling rubber seeds out of the country, bringing them to the Royal Botanical Gardens at Kew, London, cultivating rubber trees successfully in one of the greenhouses and then transplanting the saplings to, to um, uh, Malaysia, then a British colony. And um, it, was, it was a nursery for, for, for rubber trees then, Kew, as well as other things. And all over the world, and the French got them, planted them in Indochina. And the, 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 the Brazilians lost their monopoly. So Manaus, deep in the Amazon, had been a real boom town in the late 19th century, but his economy went south and has never recovered. But uh, Leopold II was growing ivory and also, sorry, growing ivory, growing rubber, but also harvesting ivory. Now, why would the Congolese um, waste their time doing this? They had, they had better things to be doing, not particularly enjoyable. Well, they were, they were forced to do it, and there were threats. Relatives were kidnapped. There'd be savage beatings if they didn't uh, meet a quota producing so much rubber ivory. Sometimes people had their hands cut off. Some people were killed. So Tipu Tip, being one of the main slavers in the region, um, starting in, it, it was based at, in, in, in um, uh, Dar es Salaam, sorry, Zanzibar, off the coast of, 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 of Tanzania, also in Dar es Salaam, um, leading expeditions deep into the hinterland to kidnap people and sell them into servitude, often to um, uh, the Arabian uh, Peninsula. And uh, he cooperated with him a little bit, but Leopold II said he was here to stamp out slavery. And what he was doing was, was rather close to slavery. So um, Roger Casement became aware of all this and was horrified about these terrible abuses because he, he, was, he was an ardent imperialist and thought that, believed in the civilizing mission where to stop um, these, these cruel acts, no slavery, and uh, we're to be bringing uh, enlightenment to what Europeans then called the dark continent, literacy and uh, certain laws and better technology and science and all the rest of them, all the rest of it, um, really emancipating the benighted. And he saw that really the opposite was going on. And so he drew attention to this. There are various other people, missionaries from around the world. There was an African-American missionary um, who uh, 
propagated um, news of these um, terrible injustices. And I can't remember who, was, who noticed that uh, at the ports, um, uh, Banana Point, the only port they have um, in, um, on, on the sea of, of, the, of the Congo Free State, there were two things going out, rubber and ivory, and two things going in, guns and chains. Why did the Congolese want so many guns and chains? How were they being paid for their labor? Um, this is before the full scale of what was going on was, was understood. Um, why did they have this insatiable desire to have guns and chains? Well, they weren't being paid at all, usually. They're being forced to, chained up, and people could be shot if they didn't do what they were told. Um, so, anyway, uh, he gathered lots of evidence, depositions, testimony, and he, there were various other people um, helping him. Um, some Catholic missionaries, some Protestant missionaries, and then it all came out in the wash. He told the British press, um, uh, His Majesty's government raised his think about it. So um, and George V brought it up with um, his distant relative Leopold II, and it was a terrible scandal about 1908. And um, so then um, Leopold II he agreed to cede um, the Congo Free State to the Belgian government. That's what became the Belgian government. And he died in disgrace a couple of years later. I think he had no children. So if I'm right, his successor, Leopold III, was his nephew. That's Roger Casement. So Casement came back to, to Ireland. He'd exposed similar abuses in, in Brazil as well, also in the rubber industry. Um, and he later, um, he, well, he had been a humanitarian, then he became the opposite, an Irish Republican. So he wanted to split us away from Great Britain. Um, and uh, he went to Germany um, by, by a roundabout route that started the First World War, because uh, as Republicans say that um, England's difficulty is Ireland's opportunity to um, secure arms from the, from the Second Reich, um, which he knew had committed uh, genocide in, in Southwest Africa, Namibia, just a few years earlier but that didn't stop him. He knew about these uh, large-scale massacres in Belgium committed by the, by the German army um, just that year, 1914. Um, so um, he tried to recruit um, uh, Irish prisoners of war for um, his, uh, his, his movement without much success because, of course, we were there. Some of us had joined the British Army, some of us captured by the Germans, and uh, he got short shrift. There were tens of thousands of Irish prisoners of war. Only 12 joined um, Casement's um, uh, Republican outfit. So it was a, an ignominious failure for him. But then he, tra he traveled via Norway, a neutral country, to get to Germany, um, uh, and leaving a big tip for the hotelier, worried the British intelligence would be, would be informed. But he got to Germany. There's a plaque on the, on the house where he lived. Um, like saying, Roger Casement, wer seine Blut für Irlands Freiheit gegeben, ein Freund Deutschlands in schwerer Zeit. Um, anyway, so um, then he finally secured the arms, but not the German officers he wanted. Was it 10,000 Mauser, something like that, um, sailing uh, on the Ord to Ireland? It was um, uh, for the Easter Rising 1916. I'm not sure I was communi communicating with the Irish Republican Brotherhood. Remember, the Irish Volunteers, as such, was not in on it, only the IRB which is a group sort of inside the Irish Volunteers, um, been a revolutionary organization for, for, for decades, not the um, uh, Irish Volunteers, which was more linked to the Home Rule Party. Anyway, so um, uh, anyway, the Royal Navy, they shattered the Ord, and they were about to force it to surrender. The Ord, I think, was unarmed, posing as a neutral ship, and the sailors have been told that they were going to Mexico, just in case anything leaked out. But anyway, um, uh, so the, the, the um, ship dumped arms, scuttled itself off the coast of Kerry, rather than hand them over to the Royal Navy. So Roger Chaseman, Chaseman got, got um, uh, um, to shore, and he was uh, arrested near McKayat's Fort at, at Banner Strand, Kerry, um, by two Royal Irish Constabulary officers. He gave a uh, false name and address, I think the name of a friend of his, but, um, and then there was a local Mr. McCowan, there were very few cars in the area. His car was used to take Casement to, I'm not sure where, the main railway station, transported to Dublin and thence to London. And I'm not sure uh, why he revealed his true identity, not very smart, but trying to slip a message to um, the IRB, you just have to abort the Easter Rising, it's not going to work. We don't have those 10,000 rifles. Because the Irish volunteers in, in, in Ju July 1914, days before the outbreak of the war, had managed to bring in um, a couple of thousand rifles here in, into Dublin. They landed them where at, at Dunleary, if I think, uh, Kingstown as it then was, parade them back into Dublin, um, really a propaganda exercise. Um, so the rising went ahead anyway. Um, they, they, they'd, it'd been cancelled, then it was uncancelled messaging to get around this complete cock up and then a total catastrophe um, for the Irish volunteers because they suffered 100% casualties. Only about 60 of them killed, but all of them um, uh, surrendered. Virtually all of them were caught. I'm not sure if a couple managed to slip away. Apparently the young, um, the young um, Sean Lamas was allowed to escape 
by a British sergeant who was sympathetic, on the base it was 15. So um, he, anyway, Casement was taken to London, tried for high treason, and he, he was saying, oh well, we have to try and move by the sense of the 20th century, not by the Middle Ages, because this part legislation was passed ages ago, which is a moronic argument, because just because um, a law is old doesn't mean it's wrong. The law against murder is very old, that doesn't make it wrong. Anyway, he was hanged in Pentonville Prison, and his remains were there for, for, for decades, till um, the Labour government and Harold Wilson gave permission for his body to be exhumed and um, uh, reburied in, in Glasnevin Cemetery. But because quicklime was poured in the grave, it was really just mud that was there. He converted to Catholicism right before his death. I never been baptised a Catholic. There's always been some doubt about it. And there was some sort of reprieve campaign, but some of his former supporters wouldn't take his side. Joseph Conrad, the, uh, the uh, Polish novelist, was horrified and said he wouldn't lend a support because this was high treason. And the Black Diaries were published. Are these genuine? Because supposedly diaries of case have been found detailing his very active gay sex life in Brazil and so on. And for decades, a furious debate raged. Much ink was spilt over whether these were forgeries. It's now broadly accepted that they are genuine. But Irish Republicans for, for decades said that they were a hoax. How dare anyone say no Irishman could possibly be gay? Um, so Republicans were as homophobic as anybody else. But now they're very political correct and they embrace him as a gay icon so um, there was something suspicious about that beard to me uh, um, anyway so that is the end of uh, Roger Casement so thank you so much for your donations I really need them to keep this channel going so make sure you give generously toodaloo